Hello and welcome back. In the previous video, we found that in the absence of a non-conservative force, energy is conserved. And now in this video, I want to study what happens to the total energy of a system when work is being done by a non-conservative force. And so, to see what happens, let's consider the work energy theorem. So the work energy theorem says the total work that's done on a system is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So now what I want to do is I want to break up the work that's being done on the system into two parts. So there's the work that's done by the conservative forces plus the sum of the work that's done by my non-conservative forces. So this sum, the sum of these two things is the total work that's being done on the system. And according to the work energy theorem, that's equal to the change in kinetic energy. So I want to rewrite this to solve for the sum of my work that's done by non-conservative forces. So that's equal to the change in kinetic energy minus the work that's done by conservative forces, or the sum of the work that's done by all my conservative forces. So now at this point, I want to rewrite this slightly. So if you remember, uh, when we talked about potential energy in the last video, we defined potential energy like this. We said that the minus the change in the potential energy is equal to the work that's done by the conservative force. That's actually how we defined potential energy. So I'm going to take this formula here and I'm going to plug it in to this equation down here. So I'm going to have this as the change in kinetic energy minus the sum, and here the work that's done by conservative forces is minus the change in the potential energy associated with that conservative force. So here we have minus a negative, so we can write this as the change in kinetic energy plus the sum of the changes in the potential energy. And finally here we have change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. So this is the change in the total energy of the system. So what we have here is that the work that's done by all of my non-conservative forces is equal to the change in the total energy of the system. Now, one thing I really want to emphasize right now is that this formula up here, this work energy theorem, this is always true. So in the last you know, the video and in this video we're talking about conservative forces and non-conservative forces. None of that matters for the work energy theorem. The work energy theorem is true no matter if the forces are conservative or non-conservative. Okay? The total work that's done by all forces is equal to the change in kinetic energy. It doesn't matter if that work is done by a conservative force or a non-conservative force. However, if there are no non-conservative forces, then we can say even more. We can say that the total energy will be conserved. And when there is a non-conservative force, then the total work that's done by the non-conservative forces is equal to the change in the total energy. This isn't just the kinetic energy, it's the change in everything, the change in the total energy. Okay? So these are sort of the three work energy relationships that we have. So now I want to look at an example. This example says a one kilogram ball is thrown vertically upwards with an initial velocity of 10 meters per second. The ball reaches a maximum height of 5 meters. What is the work that's done by drag and what's the average force that's exerted by the drag force? So let me go ahead and open up a blank screen here. Now let me write down what we were given. So we were given the mass of the ball is equal to one kilogram. It's initially given a velocity of 10 meters per second. And uh, it's change in height, right? So it's gonna start out at the ground and it's gonna end up at a final height that's five meters above the ground. So the change in height is five meters. And we're asked to find the work that's done by the non-conservative drag force. All right, so drag is a, an example of a non-conservative force. So let me go ahead and kind of draw a picture of what's going on. So the ball's going to start out down here. This is an initial position. And it has an initial velocity, v naught, And that's 10 meters per second. So the ball's going to travel up, and eventually it's going to reach its final position up here. And at this point, the ball is going to be 5 meters above its initial height. And at this point, this v final here is going to be 0 meters per second. Because remember that when an object reaches its maximum height, its vertical speed is going to be 0. So if it's thrown vertically upwards at its maximum height, 
its speed will be zero. Now, we found in the previous slide that the total work that's done by all of my non-conservative forces is equal to the change in the total energy. So in this case, the only non-conservative force we have is drag. So the work that's done by drag is equal to my final energy minus my initial energy. So the final energy, so when the ball's up here at its final position, it doesn't have any kinetic energy because it's at rest, but it has a gravitational potential energy. So my final potential energy is going to be mg h final, or delta h, I guess, as I have written up here, minus the initial energy. So initially I start out down here. So I'm starting out with zero gravitational potential energy, but I have a kinetic energy that's equal to one half m v initial squared. So now if I plug all these numbers in, I know the mass is one kilogram, g is 9.8, I know the initial velocity, I know the height that the object goes to. So if I just plug all this into a calculator, I can see that this is going to be equal to minus one joule. Okay, so the work that's done by the drag force is minus one joule. So the total energy up here is one joule less than the energy that I started with. And that loss in energy was caused by the work that was done by this frictional force, this drag force. Okay? So that was the first part. Now the next part asks us to calculate the force, the average force that drag uh, exerts on this uh, ball as it goes up in the air. So we haven't really talked about the drag force, but let me uh, explain one thing about the drag force is that it always opposes the motion of the object. Okay? So when an object's thrown vertically up in the air, drag points down. Now, we aren't really considering this, but for example, if a ball started out at rest up here and it was falling down, so it's moving down, then the drag force would point up, okay? So the drag force, it always opposes, the screen doesn't like it when I write near the corner like this, but the drag force always opposes the motion. So if the motion points down, so it's falling, okay? then the drag force points up. But here we're throwing the ball up, so the drag force is going to point down. What this means is that the work that's done by drag is always negative, right? This angle between displacement and force is always 180 degrees, okay? So the work that's done by the drag force is always minus the drag force times the displacement. In this case, my displacement is just this delta H the five meters that it travels when it goes up. So we see that the average drag force is just going to be equal to minus the work that's done by the drag force divided by delta H. So I take this one meter, I divide it by five, and we see that the, the force that's exerted by drag is equal to 0 0.2 newtons. So on average, that's the average force that the drag force exerts on the ball when it's being thrown up into the air. So at this point, I think I'd like to end this video. And in the next video, I'm going to discuss work.